master, remember the Athenians. These are the words that a servant repeated three times a day to the Persian king Darius the Great, so that he would never forget who had burned the city of Sardis. Hello and welcome to the Western Traditions Podcast. My name is Rob Paxton and this is the 14th episode in the second series of podcasts called The Greek Sun. Up until now, I have covered Greek history from its primordial beginnings until the end of the 6th century before Christ, roughly 500 BC. With this episode, I begin to discuss the Persian War, that unexpected turning point in Western history, which essentially turned the tide of Near Eastern power and heralded the beginning of the West's eventual global influence, which has lasted until the present day. Before I begin, I encourage you to visit my website at western-traditions.org. That's western-traditions.org. There you will find all the episodes, a lot of maps and helpful pictures, some good recommended reads, and some attractive Western Traditions merchandise on the shopping page. If you wish to directly support the podcast, please make contributions through the PayPal or Patreon options found on that support page. And now that I've plugged the website, let's delve into the origins of the Persian War. In the 25th episode of the first series of this podcast about the history of the ancient world, I covered the topic of the Persian Empire, which inherited in many ways the cultural patrimony of the entire Mesopotamian basin. Here in the land of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, civilization had been cultivated for thousands of years, predating even the antiquity of Egypt. When Gilgamesh ascended to the throne in the city of Uruk sometime around 3000 BC, Cities, royalty, agriculture, religion, all these cultural and technological developments were thousands of years old already. Here, over the course of possibly 10,000 years, the Mesolithic had become the Neolithic and then become the Bronze Age. When Cyrus the Great of Persia took regional power away from the Medes, who had taken it away from the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Near East was still the primary fount of civilization in the world. From here had originated ideas, techniques, and tools which had flowed out into places like Egypt, Iran, Anatolia, and the Mediterranean for thousands of years. Cyrus himself was something of a barbarian, from the cultural viewpoint of the refined and decadent Babylonians, being descended from an Indo-European-speaking peoples living in the rough lands to the east of Mesopotamia, in Persia, in what we now call Iran. But when he took power, he became the representative of that cascade of culture, that 10,000-year flourishing of thought, of technology, of wealth, that had decanted endlessly from this region into the surrounding world. He was probably the most powerful man on earth in the 6th century BC. Cyrus had taken over a decadent culture, but he was far from decadent himself. Overcoming the Median and later the Assyrian and Babylonian realms was not enough nor was it enough for his descendants on the throne. The Persians were building an empire, after all, and empires are naturally, in their early phases anyway, they are naturally very land-hungry. By the time of his death in 530 BC, Cyrus ruled over all the land, from portions of India in the east to Anatolia in the west. His son Cambyses, after he took the throne, also seized control of Egypt. Finally, Darius the Great, who seized the Persian throne in 522 BC, this Darius expanded the empire to its greatest extent, taking land along the Mediterranean coast west of Egypt, in an area known today as Libya, extending power southward into the Sudan and Africa, and also, most importantly for our purposes, he sent his armies from Anatolia into Europe, into Greek-speaking lands. Now, lands that I previously mentioned in the last episode, such as Thrace, Thessaly, Macedonia, all of these soon came under Persian control. Often, Darius did not need to use violence to accomplish these acquisitions. He simply sent emissaries to the, to the leaders of whatever lands he wanted to conquer and asked for a simple tribute of earth and water. Brought before the king of kings, these would signify that he was lord over the land and waters of whichever realm sent them back to him. Of course, there was more to it than that. 
A conquered territory had responsibilities toward the empire. At the very least, a subject king would be expected to provide taxes and troops when the empire demanded them. But he would, at least in most situations, keep his throne. The empire was divided into satrapies, which were often conglomerations of smaller political units of these lesser kingdoms. Over these, an appointed satrap would rule, but he mostly restricted his activities to collecting taxes and ensuring cooperation among the constituents of his satrapy. This is the offer that came to the Athenians in 491 BC, after the Persians had subjugated most of the lands to the north of them. In fact, Darius had sent emissaries to all the Greek realms. From all but two, he received the tribute of earth and water, signs of submission to Persian supremacy all but two. The Athenians heard out the ambassadors and then executed them. The Spartans did the same. They were the first casualties in a war that would not just stop the Persian tide, but disrupt the entire flow of power in the eastern Mediterranean that had existed since prehistorical times. The West was coming to life. The earliest account that we have of the Persian War was written by Herodotus, a Greek born in the city of Halicarnassus, which lies on the western coast of Anatolia. In 480 BC, he was born just six years after the Battle of Marathon. He was a speaker of Doric Greek, as Halicarnassus was a Dorian Greek colony, but he would write his famous history of the Persian War in Ionian Greek, probably while living in Athens in his later years. During his adult years, Herodotus may have traveled quite a bit, but we can only make educated guesses based on his writings, because there's no history about the father of history, as he was called by the Roman poet and speaker Cicero many centuries later. It seems likely that this Greek writer participated in an uprising against Persian rule in his hometown of Halicarnassus sometime in the middle of the century, and probably traveled during his life to Egypt, to the Phoenician city of Tyre, and probably went as far as Babylon. Eventually, though, he left Halicarnassus and moved to Athens. This was probably sometime after 450 BC. Here, most likely, he would have written his book, simply titled Histories. This work is notable for many reasons, among them that it is really the first known historical piece of writing that utilized research and investigation in order to support its claims. Today, due to his many errors, both obvious and perceived, today Herodotus is sometimes called the father of lies rather than the father of history. But this maligning of Herodotus is unjust. Herodotus wrote as best he could on the subjects at hand, relying entirely on either his own personal observations or on second or third hand accounts. He did not have the internet, he did not have the telephone, he may not have even had any available books. And anyway, we already accept that the accounts that were available to him were not investigative, research-based works, but were really more poetry or religious works with an agenda to prove. So given that he was the very first that we know of to try to write from an objective point of view, I think he deserves some forgiveness. Regardless, Herodotus's history is interesting for many reasons. Besides telling the history of the Persian War, Herodotus engages in numerous lengthy digressions, apparently supporting a belief in really laying a strong foundation for his story. Indeed, the entirety of the second volume of the history, it was nine volumes long, the entire second volume is a digression about the history of Egypt prior to its conquest by Persia. Much of the following volumes really go into deep background about the royal families of Persia and about their various wars of conquest in Egypt and in the Black Sea area against the Scythians and other Indo-European speaking peoples that inhabited the steppes of central Eurasia. It's not until volume five that we actually hear anything about even the preliminaries to the Persian War. And the famous Battle of Marathon is not finally explained until volume six. Now, this podcast is not merely a history podcast. I don't call it the Western History Podcast, but rather the Western Traditions Podcast, because my goal is to pass down not just the raw history, but the culture of the West. And the culture is a set of beliefs, values, ideas, art, religions, philosophies, attitudes, desires, and so on, which pertain to that particular group of people. So, without churning out a Cliffsnote version of Herodotus's history of the Persian War, 
I want to guide the discussion of the matter using his book, which is a fundamental text for our Western traditions. And so, before we get into the dates and names of battles, let's take a look at the matters whose understanding Herodotus thought were essential to understanding the war with the Persians. To his credit, Herodotus does indeed try to begin the history with an explanation of the enmity between the Persians and the Greeks. It's just that, in seeking out the roots of the conflict, he goes back much farther than we might do so ourselves. Each of the nine volumes in the histories is named after one of the muses. The first volume, named Cleo, for the muse of lyre playing, begins with an account of the Phoenicians who, one time in the distant past, laid out their goods for sale on the shores of Argos, that Greek land on the, in the Peloponnesus. Women of the region came down to see the goods, and, while they were giving their attention to shopping, the Phoenicians suddenly rushed up, captured them, and sailed away to Egypt. Among the women, according to one version of the tale, was Io. This brief little tale brings up a number of connections to things that I have mentioned in earlier podcast episodes. It begins with a story about Phoenicians, and that must have been, when Herodotus told the tale, it must have already been a thousand years old. See episode 16 from my first series. It's about the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, and how long they had been sailing the coasts of the Mediterranean, while kingdoms, one after the other, rose and fell around them. And this account also mentions Argos on the Peloponnesus, and Notice the behavior of the women. I have already gone on at length in a previous episode about the different way that women lived in different cultural regions. Here in the West, the women were freely coming down to the shore and doing their shopping. Perhaps this was madly provocative to the Phoenicians, who were from a region where women were more often kept in seclusion, as I described in the last episode. And this story also brings in Io, whom, according to mythology, Zeus loved and impregnated. She went on a series of adventures in that well-known myth, became transformed into a heifer, and eventually married an Egyptian king by the name of Telegonus. Now, Herodotus does not engage in any of this elaboration because he knew that the story was well known to his contemporaries, and he had only to mention her name. But Io is fascinating for many reasons. She goes to Egypt in this account, and she is called, according to Herodotus, in some versions of the story, she is called Isis and her husband in those stories is Osiris. And I told the story of Osiris in my Egyptian episodes in the first series. He is the god who suffers, dies, and is resurrected. Sound familiar? And Io heads an impressive family tree in mythology with numerous heroes in its branches, and it even leads eventually to Dionysius, another dying and resurrected god, whose mystery religions now, at the time of Herodotus, proliferated in the Greek world. I'm digressing a bit here, like Herodotus, but let me make a final point about this opening passage. It is also an introduction to a unique characteristic in Herodotus's writing. When Herodotus tells a story, he frequently gives more than one variation of the tale, recognizing none of them as an orthodox version. Here he tells how this is a Persian account, and then he goes and gives a Phoenician version in which Io happily went off with the sailors, having become intimate with the ship's captain. But throughout his work, Herodotus will bring up alternate explanations for various accounts, both mythological and historical. It is a surprising and refreshing stance, this open-mindedness to the possibility of different reasons for the events that he describes. He is not thundering about an official narrative, as we will often see in regard to religious squabbles in later episodes. Instead, he is trying to find evidence, and is not dead set on crafting an orthodox version of anything. Anyway. He goes on to describe how the Greeks retaliate in later years and carry off Europa, another mythological love interest of Zeus's, from the shores of Phoenicia, and he includes stories about Medea and even Helen of Troy as well in all of this. So Herodotus ties the causes of the Persian War right from the start into the very fundamental stories of Greek mythology. The two sides, West versus East, Greek versus Asian, he seems to say, had always been at odds. You see, the Persian War was really just another chapter in a story that went all the way back to the Trojan War, when Greece invaded Anatolia, and even before that. 
Herodotus then goes on to tell the story of the lineage of Croesus, king of Lydia in Anatolia. I have already mentioned this king and recount, recounted one of the stories told here, how he met Solon the Athenian, who showed him that you could not judge the happiness of a man while he was still alive, and that the greatest happiness was in love and honor, not in wealth and splendor. In telling of King Proesus' ancestors, Herodotus does relate a saucy tale about how his great-great-grandfather, Gyges, was the bodyguard of a king from a previous dynasty that ruled Lydia. This king, Candales by name, had a beautiful wife, and he wouldn't stop telling Gyges about her physical beauty. Finally, he forced his favorite bodyguard to watch secretly from a doorway as his wife undressed to lay with him that night, so that Gyges would finally understand how beautiful the woman was. Gyges complied, and he observed the woman in her nakedness, but he was noticed observing by the wife. Herodotus points out here that the barbarians, the non-Greeks living in Lydia, are extremely offended by nakedness and by being seen naked. But instead of showing her alarm, the woman later connived with Gyges to kill the king, to marry her, and to usurp the throne. Thus did Croesus's ancestor seize power. More pertinently, in this accounting, Herodotus tells us of how Croesus's father, Aliates, made war against the Medes. The Median Empire ruled much of Mesopotamia before Cyrus the Great conquered it and established the Persian Empire. This story then ties into the history of the rise of the Persian Empire and Croesus' eventual encounter with Cyrus, who conquers Lydia and plans to burn Croesus, until he hears the tale of Solon's wisdom and he makes Croesus his court companion. I told all this as well in detail in episode 25 of the first podcast series. I note also in this tale that the Lydian kings resort to consulting the oracle at Delphi, which is interesting because they would have been so far away, so the oracle must have had some international significance back then, unless the story is inaccurate, always a possibility, as even Herodotus himself was unafraid to say. We also learn here how Croesus reached out to the Greeks for aid when his capital city, Sardis, was besieged by Cyrus. The Spartans were even setting sail to help him when they learned that Sardis had already fallen. Of course, for the Greek reader or listener, because often a work like that of Herodotus would be read to the public, since books were too rare and expensive for members of the general public to own anyway, Greeks reading or hearing this account would be cued in to so many points. The mythology, the Spartans, the oracle, the Persians, even the mention of Sardis would be significant, since the Greeks hearing this would know that the Athenians in 498 BC would set fire to that city in another chapter of this long conflict, and spur the Persian kings to the revenge they sought when they fought the Athenians at Marathon. Here also, in the very long and very dense Book I of the Histories, we find the story of Harpagus, the servant to the Median king who was tricked into eating the body of his own son. Details on that gruesome story can also be found in Episode 25 of the first series on my website, western-traditions.org. One of the values of Herodotus' writing really are his frequent digressions. They provide a wealth of cultural knowledge. Here in Book 1, he provides a rundown of Persian culture as best it could be known to a Greek. So describes the Greek realms on the coast of Anatolia, according to their origins, be they Ionian, Doric, or Aeolian. And he describes, while telling the story of the rise of Cyrus, which we have already heard, he describes the city of Babylon, which he must have visited during his life. He tells of the immense walls that gird the city, its multiple towers and temples, and he relates cultural information about the Babylonians. For instance, he tells us how the Babylonian women, once in their lives, must present themselves at the Temple of Aphrodite. Here, surely, he means Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of love, but the Greeks were quick to identify all foreign gods as versions of their own. They even did this with the Egyptians. Anyway, whoever the goddess was, the women had to sleep with one of the anonymous men who approached them before their temple, before they could get married. Now this may or may not be simply a salacious tale about the barbarians of Babylon. But he also tells important details about their dress, their commerce, and so on, things which would, we would have no idea of if it were not for Herodotus. Now book one really is a cultural treasure. Herodotus tells us here a great deal about more than battles, and wars, but also provides information about a variety of ancient peoples, about whom we would otherwise know very little or nothing, such as the Phrygians or the Scythians. 
Book two is largely about Egypt, about its history, its geography, its religion, and its culture. He tells about the building of the pyramids, about the rise and the fall of the Nile River throughout the year, and more. Now, he devotes these passages to Egypt ostensibly because he is about to relate the Persian campaign to seize control of that country in the reign of Cyrus's son Cambyses, but that he devotes a whole book to painting such a detailed picture of Egypt should tell us just how important Egypt was in the Greek worldview. Myself, it does not seem very intuitive to pair ancient Greek with Egypt, probably because the way that their mythologies are presented in our schooling, it's so com compartmentalized, without any recognition of the living, flowing cultural exchange that surely characterized the ancient world. There is no doubt that Egypt had massive influence on Greek culture. It is mentioned in their earliest myths. Recall figures from mythology that traveled to Egypt, such as Io and Menelaus. And Perseus travels beyond Egypt to Ethiopia in his adventures. Egypt also appears as a setting in the great plays of the classical era, so perhaps it should not surprise us that the entirety of Book Two in Herodotus's history is devoted to this realm. The third book in Herodotus's history tells us of the, of the Persian conquest of Egypt. Other books in this history contain descriptions of great cruelty and depravity, but there are some remarkable ones here. Before the final battle between Cambyses and the pharaoh Semenitus, some of the Egyptian king's Greek mercenaries take revenge on the traitor who led the Persian army into Egypt. Knowing that this traitor is watching from the Persian camp, the mercenaries take the man's sons, many of, of, of whom he left behind in Egypt, and leads them out in front of the army in full view of everyone. And there they slit the boy's throats, one by one, over a bowl which captures their blood. Then the mercenaries drink the blood before the battle begins. Now, ten days after the battle, which the Persians win, Cambyses the Persian king humiliates the captive pharaoh by parading his daughters as slaves doing menial, menial labor before the man's eyes. Then the Persians lead his son, as well as 2,000 other Egyptian captives, past the pharaoh. Each of the young men and his son with ropes around their necks and bridles in their mouths, symbolizing their new status as slaves. Now Herodotus, in a, re in a revealing passage, also describes the aftermath on this Egyptian battlefield, which even in his time, decades later, was still carpeted in the bones of the fallen soldiers of each side. However, the historian also goes out of his way to describe the Persian appreciation for wisdom, the quality of mercy, the captive pharaoh, Semenitus, does not show any grief or emotion at all when he sees his children disgraced before his eyes. He only stares down at the ground. But, immediately after this train of misery passes by, Semenitus sees an elderly friend of his family, once wealthy and powerful, begging the Persians for alms. This causes him to burst into tears. The Persian king Cambyses sends a messenger to ask the captive pharaoh why he wept for his friend, but not for his children. Semenitus, the fallen pharaoh, answers thus, O son of Cyrus, my own misfortunes were too great for tears, but the woe of my friend deserved them. When a man falls from splendor and plenty into beggary at the threshold of old age, one may well weep for him. Croesus, the former king of Lydia, is at Cambyses' side when this reply is given, and he also bursts into tears probably recalling his own fall from grace. Cambyses is so moved that he orders the son of the pharaoh to be spared from execution. In a truly tragic moment, the kind we shall see repeated many times in Greek history, this order to spare the son of Semenitus arrives too late. The torturers have already ripped the prince's body to pieces. Later, Semenitus stirs up revolt in Egypt, and Cambyses has him killed. According to Herodotus, the pharaoh was forced to drink bull's blood, which the ancient world believed to be poisonous. Now, drinking bull's blood does not cause death, but it does in this story. Perhaps it's all fictional, but some posit that he used the terms bull's blood here as a euphemism for poison. Anyway, in general, the portrait painted of Cambyses in this book is one of a mad king. His behavior becomes more and more unhinged as this tale is told, until he finally dies. 
Here also in Book 3 we, we find the story of how Cambyses died and how his throne was usurped by an impostor who posed as his younger brother. The impostor is then turned out by Darius, who will be Persian king at the time of the war with the Greeks. I have related this tale already in the 25th episode of my first podcast series. Like all the nine books in this history, Book 3 is very dense with detailed accounts of the doings of various persons and realms in the Near East and in Greece. There are countless stories throughout the history of Herodotus that I will not even touch upon because, one, there is not enough time, and two, I don't want to churn out an oral Cliff Notes version of such a great work. I highly recommend, you, recommend that you pick it up and read it yourself if you have not already done so. Now, in Book 4, Herodotus is still not ready to begin the story of the Persian War. Instead, he describes the culture and history of the Scythians and the Libyans. The Libyans live to the west of Egypt, and the Scythians to the north of the Black Sea. But these are not really digressions for Herodotus. The Persians battle with and or conquer the peoples in these lands, and he uses these conquests as narrative opportunities to simultaneously describe the geography and the culture of the world around him, even as he intends to bring the focus in, eventually, to very specific people and events relating more directly to the Greek war with the Persians. Now, the Scythians are a mobile people, as Herodotus describes them, having neither forts nor cities, and they are thus unconquerable, since no one can seize their capital. They simply move farther back into the steppes of Central Asia when threatened. Their soldiers ride on horseback and use bows and arrows and javelins for harassing attacks. They sound, actually, a great deal like the Persians, as described in the last episode of my first podcast series, and a lot like the Proto-Indo-Europeans are imagined to have been, that is, a mobile people with wagons and horses and herds of livestock. Now, the history of Herodotus uses sensationalism as much as any modern publication. In fact, the episodes that he describes are much more tawdry and raunchy and gruesome than you will often find in any modern history. With the Scythians, he relates numerous cultural details certain to sicken the civilized members of his Greek audience. Here's some examples, but remember that these stories that Herodotus believes to be true about the Scythians may or may not be. Some aspects of his history we can confirm with archaeology, but with some details we just have to take his word for it. The Scythian warriors, he says, drink the blood of the first man that they kill in battle. They also cut off their enemies' heads and turn them into their king. They often choose some of those heads as their share of the booty, and they strip the skull of its flesh and use the scalp as a napkin. The skulls themselves they use as drinking cups after lining their exteriors or interiors with leather or gold. Others flay the cadavers of their defeated enemies and use the skins to upholster their arrow quivers or even ride about with the skins displayed on a frame. Now, the Scythians are also described here to have come into contact with the famous Amazons, the tribe of female warriors. After encountering the Amazons in battle, and only discovering that they were women after examining the corpses of the dead on the battlefield, the Scythians sent a party of some of their youngest men to find the Amazons again. But when the women come out to do battle, the young men do as instructed and pull back, avoiding conflict. This continues until the Amazons realize that the Scythian men do not intend any harm. Eventually, they come together and live for a time as one tribe, these young men and the Amazon women. This is all according to plan, as the Scythian elders desire to have the young men breed with this tribe and produce offspring of such formidable women. Curiously, as time passes, the men are unable to learn the language of the women, but the women easily pick up the Scythian language in order to converse with the men. The men invite them to return to their city and homeland, and become their wives, even promising to have no other women besides them. Here is the Amazon reply. We cannot live with your women. Our customs are different. To draw the bow, to hurl the javelin, to ride the horse. Your women stay in their wagons. They never go out to hunt or do anything. We would never agree with each other. Instead, the Amazon suggests to the young men, go home and acquire your inheritances and come back to live with us. This the young men do, and the newly united tribe rides away to start their own society a little farther east, somewhere between the Black Sea and the Caspian. This is how Herodotus explains the origins of the Soromatai, a tribe still existing in his time, and allied with the Scythians. Now, Darius, king of Persia, before coming to conquer Greece, set out to 
against the Scythians and their allies. He wished, among other things, to secure what would become his right flank for an invasion of the Greek mainland. He went through many difficulties with the Scythians, and, being unable to obtain a complete victory over these nomads, he marched his army westward to the Danube River, which is called the Ister River in this ancient text. Here, finally, a relevant Greek name enters the story. The bridge over the Danube River, at this time, is held by a Greek force that serves the Persians. Now, Miltiades is an Athenian by birth, but he has become king over, or tyrant, over a realm that geographically now, is part of the Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey, just across from Anatolia, in the region of the Bosporus. His land is presently subject to the Persians, as are the other Greeks that are with him. Scythians try to convince these Greeks to destroy the bridge and trap Darius's struggling army in Scythia, so that the Scythians might wear them down and destroy them utterly. According to Herodotus, Miltiades was all for this solution, but the other generals in charge of the guarding force declined. Instead, they deceived the Scythians into thinking that they would trap the Persians by destroying part of the bridge, but, when Darius and his army arrived, they helped them cross the river with their fleet. We will hear more about Miltiades when the Persians come to do battle at Marathon. So Darius escapes Scythia with his army more or less intact, and then he crosses back into Asia at the Dardanelles Strait. He leaves behind a force of 80,000 soldiers under the command of a trusted lieutenant, Magabasus. In a passage that will have great significance for thousands of years, right up until the present, in fact, Megabasis remarks that the locals living on the Dardanelles Straits are fools because they have not settled or fortified the portion of that strait known later as Byzantium. This region of the strait would later become Constantinople, the capital of the Roman Empire in the 4th century AD, and function as the key property to own in order to control east-west traffic and trade. Today it is known as Istanbul. Book 4 contains many more interesting tales and cultural details about people in Asia and in Africa, but let us accelerate now toward the Persian War. Book 5 of the history begins with this same Megabasis, the commander of the Persians in Greece, and his progress in reducing various Greek city-states. Here we also learn some details about the history of Athens and its government, some of which I have already shared in the twelfth episode of the second series about that city. Now, when Herodotus's narrative turns to Greek affairs, it is always a little complicated and deep. Greek politics, especially Athenian politics, were always an intricate, involved matter. In truth, trying to summarize any passage in this history would require more text than the original because there is so much background to explain, about political matters especially. So, I will describe the events leading up to the Persian War in this way. As we already know, the Persians were occupying the northern lands of the Greek mainland, having recently conquered them. For some time already, they were also the overlords of the Greeks living on the western coast of Anatolia, in places like Miletus and Herodotus's hometown Halicarnassus. The populations of these places remained largely Greek, with some Persian colonists or merchants operating there and Persian garrisons nearby to maintain order. Meanwhile, and this is probably in or about 498 BC, Athens was in its usual chaotic state, with one political group outlawing, harassing, and exiling rival groups. Without getting too detailed, one of these groups of exiles had fled to Sardis, a city in Anatolia, actually the old capital of King Proesis, about whom we have heard quite a bit already. There was political intrigue involved, and one thing about such group of exiles is that they usually connived with people, wherever they wound up, to help them return to their city and overthrow its government. This kind of thing just happened left and right in ancient Greece. So the Athenians, the ones in power in Athens anyway, were naturally a bit nervous about these exiles conspiring with the Persians in Sardis, all the while with a large Persian army menacing in the north. So they sent word to Artaphernes, the Persian satrap or governor of Sardis, they sent him word to ignore these exiles. But Artaphernes had been won over by the exiles, who promised cooperation with the Persian conquest in return for Persian help reclaiming power in their hometown. So he replied to the Athenians that they must accept the exiles back if they wished to remain safe. 
And here is the moment when the destiny of the Western world hung in the balance. Athens could have chosen the easy route. They could have accepted the exiles in return and avoided conflict with the world's greatest power. But when tiny Athens, with its lousy soil, its few thousand soldiers, and its minuscule navy, when Athens received word that the Persian Empire would not bow to its demands regarding a handful of exiles, the Athenians sat in council and basically just said, well, we're going to war with Persia. But there was more to their defiance than just moxie, just stubborn willfulness. Recall from episode 12 how many times Athens had already been through the cycle of exile and overthrow. When one group was in power in Athens, it understood all too well what the return of their enemies meant. Accepting the exiles back was also accepting their own likely exile. The banished men would return and probably with assistance from their new Persian friends, turn right around and exile the previously ruling party in Athens. So it was in the ruling party's best interest to say no to submission, to say yes to war. What is most impressive about this decision is that it was later supported by the populace, who had to go out and do the actual fighting, and lose their homes and lives if they failed, whereas accepting the exiles back would just mean a change of regimes. So the heroism of, of the moment is really found in the masses of Athens, who accepted their political superiors' unbending will in the matter, and went beyond the city walls, in arms, when the time came to fight Persia. So. They sailed out in 20 ships. Herodotus is not clear about the number of soldiers or sailors here, but we can assume a few thousand. And these ships reached the Anatolian coast, and there their forces joined with others from other Ionian Greek colonies, and they marched on Sardis. They captured the city, but they were not able to plunder it because it caught fire during the upheaval. Destroyed as well in all this tumult was the Temple of Cybele, a goddess about whom I will speak in a future episode. The destruction of this temple, sacred to the locals, would be remembered by the Persians. Then the Athenians and their allies fled, while the city burned to the ground. When King Darius of Persia learned of this event, according to Herodotus, his first words in response were, Who are the Athenians? So remote and insignificant were these people that the great king had not even heard of them. Now they came into his focus. Darius sent for his bow notched an arrow and fired it into the sky, and, according to the Greek Herodotus, he asked Zeus to grant him revenge on the Athenians. Presumably, Darius would have actually asked his own god, Ahura Mazda, for such a favor, but, as previously stated, the Greeks identified their gods with the gods of other nations. He also ordered one of his servants, from then on, every day at dinner, to repeat to him the following words three times, Remember the Athenians. Intrigue upon intrigue, the Athenians and their fellow Ionians were busy with sedition. Some of them tried to help the island of Cyprus to free itself, but a rebellion failed after a bloody struggle. The towns of the Anatolian coast also rebelled, but they were put down by the Persians. The city of Miletus itself, its men were virtually all killed, and its women and children carted off to exile in Persia. The Persian armies razed many of the cities that they conquered or reconquered, sometimes burning them to the ground. And the Phoenicians, still independent but willing allies of the Persians, aided them with their navy. However justified as they might have been in seeking revenge, the Persians, even through Herodotus's partisan eyes, often practiced much discretion and mercy. The exiles from Miletus, according to Herodotus, were given land near the Persian capital, for example. When a son of Miltiades, who had tried to convince his fellow generals to cut the bridge over the Danube and trap the Persian army in Scythia, when Miltiades' son was captured during a portion of this conflict, Darius did not execute him. Instead, he settled the man in Persia, gave him a Persian wife and a home, and accepted, in later years, his children from this woman as Persians. Indeed, the following spring, Darius put one Mardonius in charge of a large force of soldiers and sailors, and sent him to re-establish control on the Ionian coast of Anatolia. He did so quickly, but in every city ruled by a tyrant, he replaced the government with a democracy. Now, Mardonius tried to carry on the conquest into Greece proper. However, sailing down the coast from the Dardanelles Straits, he tried to round Mount Athos, 
a famous mountainous peninsula, which is today known for its Orthodox Christian monasteries. When Mardonius tried to round this cape, much of the fleet was destroyed by violent winds, and, according to Herodotus, by the numerous sea monsters that live in those waters, which devoured many of the shipwrecked men. Perhaps he means sharks here. Mardonius suffered more trouble fighting locals in Thrace, and eventually the expedition was abandoned. However, Darius had secured the passage into Europe with control of both sides of the Dardanelle Strait, and his attentions upon Greece were clear. The following year, in 491 BC, he sent emissaries to each of the Greek cities, requesting earth and water as a token of their submission. Most complied. Sparta and Athens did not. The Athenians put the diplomats on trial and then executed them. The Spartans killed their ambassadors outright, without the exercise of a trial. The sudden agreement and political alignment of Sparta and Athens was unlikely. The two had frequently been in conflict. Remember how the Spartans had often themselves participated in helping exiled tyrants return to power in Athens. And the two cities were naturally in conflict as well because they were now the two leading powers in the region. Sparta had been a regional leader for a long time, and Athens had moved up in the world since the reforms of Solon. But now both were at war with the Persians, with Persian blood on their hands. In 490 BC, Darius himself took charge of the matter. He marshaled his forces in Susa, the Persian capital, and put two trusted men in charge. The army was a composite of his empire, each ethnic group and region contributing somewhat to the total, but with the core being made up of Persians. Some, though, came from as far away as India. Most, in comparison to the Greeks, were lightly armed. Accustomed to the typical style of battle in Asia, many soldiers either wore leather armor or no armor at all. Some carried a wicker shield. They were armed with short spears or swords. They also brought some archers with bows and arrows. The actual Persian forces were probably armored more heavily with scale mail, a type of armor made up of overlapping scales or plates of metal worn to cover the upper body. In the last episode, I described how the Greek hoplites, in comparison, utilized much heavier armor and weaponry. The exact number of Persian forces is not known. Herodotus does not give a number here, but other ancient sources estimate an army in the size of hundreds of thousands. Modern scholars are less credulous of these numbers, but still believe that it must have numbered at least 25,000. In general, I myself agree that ancient numbers tend to exaggerate while accounts of Alexander the Great's encounter with the Persian army at Arbella in 331 BC, for example, put the Persian forces at somewhere around 1 million, which seems hard to imagine just given the logistical needs for such a force. Conversely, I also think that modern calculations may underestimate the ancients and we don't give them enough credit for their logistical capabilities. It seems like the total Persian forces, including naval and support troops, could have included 100,000, even if that number has no relation to the number of troops that would actually land in Greece. Herodotus does say that these men were loaded onto 600 triremes after they marched to the coast of Anatolia. A trireme was a type of large ocean-going vessel consisting of three levels or banks of oars. I say ocean-going vessel, but typically ships in this time stayed close to shore and did not set out into the wide blue ocean. Navigational abilities were just not that developed, but given the possibility of one or two hundred men on each ship, this could bring the total to a hundred thousand, but we can't know for sure. Now, the islands of the Aegean, which I have mentioned before, create a series of stepping stones between Anatolia and Greece. Darius, having already suffered failures in trying to cross his army over farther north at the Dardanelles Straits, daringly decided to ship his forces across the Aegean Sea. First, they landed on the island of Naxos and sacked the city, burning the temple there, apparently as a sign of retaliation for the burning of the temple at Sardis. They enslaved the inhabitants who had not fled, and then moved on. After they skipped through the Cyclades Islands, the Persian forces landed next on the island of Euboea. I mentioned it in the last podcast, a long island off the coast of Attica. And now they were truly in Greece proper. They ravaged the towns there, besieging Eritrea for a week before burning it down. And now they were just a stone's throw away just a stone's throw across a narrow sea passage from Attica and Athens. Far away, in the Persian capital, a servant still reminded Darius every day to remember the Athenians. 
and now his army was close, and animated by victories and the raising of cities. His generals had only to pick a place to land these bloodthirsty forces, and then march on Athens. They chose the beach at Marathon. The Athenians had been busy this whole time. The Athenians were always busy. When Sparta and Athens came to their own conflict decades later, this was something that a Spartan general remarked about the Athenians with reluctant admiration in his voice. They were always at work, he said, these Athenians, planning, doing, investing, coercing, talking, traveling. The empire had plodded along methodically, making its slow progress from Susa to the Ionian coast of Anatolia and across the Aegean Sea. Meanwhile, Athens had prepared for war against the greatest power on the planet. First, they secured matters to their rear. Aegina, an island in the Saronic Gulf between Athens and Sparta, had accepted the Persian request for earth and water. That island would be a perfect base for Persian naval operations, so Athens asked the Spartans to intervene. One of the Spartan kings, though, favored Aegina and its choice to submit to Persia. In a diplomatic intrigue, that king was deposed after the other king bribed the oracle at Delphi to declare him illegitimate and have him replaced. This dishonorable bribery was discovered, though, and then that other king was also deposed. So as war with Persia approached then, there was a complete turnover of kings in Sparta. One of the two kings who now came to the throne at this time was a fifty-year-old man named Leonidas. This is the same Leonidas who would die valiantly with three hundred comrades at the gates of Thermopylae. Anyway, the threat of Aegina was quelled, and the Athenians moved on. They secured the assistance also of Plataea. Plataea was a small city in Boeotia, its origins went back to as early as Homer's Iliad, where it is mentioned briefly. The people of that town, caught between the political struggles of Thebes, Athens, and Sparta a few decades before, had allied with Athens. The Athenians knew that Eritrea had been attacked. They readied their army. When they learned that the Persians were disembarking their armada at Marathon, they dispatched 10,000 men to the area to block the exits from the beach while, hopefully, they waited for reinforcements from Sparta. Now, there were probably about 300,000 people, free and slave, in the Athenian territory at this time. To give you an idea of what this force of 10,000 meant to the Athenians, realize that if the United States in 2023 mobilized an equivalent portion of its populace, it would have to field an army of over 10 million men. This number may have been a majority of their adult male citizens. We also know that it included slaves who had been promised freedom in exchange for military service. The matter of command here is something we're still confused about. Herodotus reports that the Athenians had ten generals over the army, and this accords with what we know about the reforms of 6th century BC in Athens, which I covered in episode 12. The populace had been divided into ten tribes, which each had representation in the army with one general, or strategos, as he was known in Greek. According to, also to Herodotus, command of the army rotated each day between these ten strategos, there being a new leader each day in the spirit of democracy. Modern scholars are not so sure about this haphazard way of commanding an army, especially that one on which the survival of your nation depends, and think that it may be a misunderstanding on the part of Herodotus, who was not a native Athenian after all and wrote about the battle half a century later. Regardless, we do know that among the ten generals was Miltiades, the general previously working in league with the Persians, and who had also allegedly been the one to suge suggest destroying the bridge over the Danube and trapping the Persians in Scythia. Wherever the army was commanded, we know that the initial goal was to delay the Persians until the Spartans arrived. This way the enemy could be met with the full force available to the Allies. However, this plan was founded on false hope. The Athenians sent a fast runner to Sparta to tell of the landing and the need for reinforcements. The Spartans, though, were in the middle of a sacred celebration, the Carnea, which could not be interrupted and during which no military operations could be conducted. Since the Spartans could not march until the rising of the next full moon, per the festival's religious rules, reinforcements at the beach of Marathon would be delayed about ten days. Now, this might seem ridiculous to us today. The Spartans knew full well that their existence, their freedom, depended on the outcome of this battle. 
yet they would not break a religious rule to save their own lives. This is testimony to how much it mattered to many ancient peoples to hold fast to their traditions, no matter the consequences. So the Athenian goal was to delay combat with the Persians for as long as they could, hoping for the Spartans to arrive and bolster their numbers. While they waited, there was one bright sign of hope. A thousand men from Plataea, their full complement of hoplites, arrived to join the Athenians. What happened on day five of this encounter is a matter of contention. Considering that this book is meant to describe the Persian War, Herodotus gives surprisingly little detail about such a crucial battle, not only in the history of the war, but of Greece and the world. After entire volumes devoted to background material, he tells of this battle in just a few paragraphs. Anyway, here it is as Herodotus tells it. Miltiades, one of the strategos, was all along eager to attack the Persians, to take the initiative away from them. Four other generals were with him in this. The other half of the generals wished to delay the Persians until the Spartans arrived. This, actually, throughout the next century, at least, of Greek military strategy, was a common thought, to let the Spartans make the tough decisions and do the hard things. When Xenophon and the 10,000 march away from Babylon in the next century in search of a safe haven, they naturally elect a Spartan to be put in charge of their forces. But Miltiades wanted to attack as soon as possible. As Herodotus tells us, whenever a general allied with Miltiades in this opinion had charge of the army, he deferred to Miltiades, wishing him to be in charge. But Miltiades, according to Herodotus, waited to act until the day that he was actually meant to be in command, on day five, to give his orders. And he did. He put Callimachus in charge of the right wing of the army. Callimachus was the polemarch, the archon, in charge of the military for Athens. Remember that the Athenians were led by a cabinet of archons, each with his own area of responsibility. So Callimachus was kind of like the secretary of defense, but not superior to Miltiades on this day. The Plataeans were placed on the left wing. Upon forming for battle, it was noticed that the Persian forces, which outnumbered the Greeks, stood in a battle line much longer than that of the Greeks. So the depth of the Greek forces was thinned so that they might stretch the wings of the battle line out to an equal distance with that of the Persians, and thus avoid being flanked. According to Herodotus, this left the center of the Greek line weakest, with the least number of troops. The Persians also readied for battle, watching the Greeks maneuver into place. The armies stood about a mile apart. Herodotus makes a quick remark here that should be emphasized. He says that the victims showed themselves favorable, and then the Athenians attacked. The victims would be the animals sacrificed in a ritual, their entrails examined as portents, as a way to guide the decisions of the next moment. Again, just note the importance of things that we would consider silly superstitions, to the point that life and death matters battles were initiated or not according to the results of these animal sacrifices and other religious rituals. Nevertheless, without further ado, once the victims showed themselves to be favorable to the Greek attack, the Greeks suddenly charged. They did so without horsemen or archers and slammed into the Persian line. Heavy armored Greeks met the lightly armored Persians in a set-piece battle for the first time. A length of time passed, according to Herodotus, in his words, as the armies fought on the plain, before the Persians and their allies broke the center of the Greek line and chased the fleeing Athenians into the countryside. But the two Greek wings, the Plataeans on the left and the Athenians, led by Callimachus on the right, were victorious against the Persian wings. And so the Greeks performed a famous and later repeated tactical maneuver. Instead of fleeing as the Greek center did, the Plataean and Athenian wings turned inward and crushed the Persian forces trapped between them. I will put a picture of this on the website at western-traditions.org to clarify just how this looked. The Persians were routed. They fled to their ships, and the Greeks cut them down as they ran. So eager were they to stop the Persians from leaving that they actually ran into the waters and grabbed onto the ships trying to depart, so that they might kill the Persians aboard. They actually captured seven of the ships. Herodotus also records how a certain soldier lost his hand doing this as he grabbed the stern of the boat, and a Persian lopped off his hand with an axe. Modern scholars puzzle about many details of this account. For example, where were the cavalry? This is a big question. The Persians arrived with cavalry and archers and sundry other auxiliary troops, but the Greeks seem to have been able to cross a mile of terrain on foot in heavy armor without deterrence of any sort. 
Some speculate that the event really went this way. We know from Herodotus's account that the fleeing Persians subsequently embarked and then sailed around Attica, intending to land directly at Athens and attack. According to Herodotus, the Athenians knew this and sped back overland to the city to defend it. The Persians arrived, weighed anchor, saw that the Athenians waited nearby to defend the city, and then sailed away to Asia. So perhaps the Persians at Marathon were already embarking to do this, already placing their cavalry on the ships, tired of waiting at Marathon and intending to take the war directly to Athens. Then, during the usual disorder that might be expected while performing such a departure, the Greeks made a surprise attack. Perhaps the Miltiades story about always wanting to attack is just pro-Miltiades propaganda. The Greeks really attacked, according to this line of thinking, because they saw an opportunity in some chaos amid the Persian camp, and then afterwards raced back home to defend Athens from the de departing fleet. Some 6,000 Persians fell here, says Herodotus, and only 192 Athenians, including Callimachus, the polemarch. Such a lopsided victory may sound unrealistic, but the truth is that true battlefield victories are often thus. The side that breaks and runs is slaughtered as it loses order and cohesion. There may be some exaggeration in Herodotus' account, but surely the Persians were soundly defeated and forced to flee. As already stated, they loomed off the coast of Athens for a while before accepting defeat and returning to Asia. Three days after the full moon rose, 2,000 Spartans, Lacedaemonians in Herodotus' words, arrived at Athens. After learning that the Athenians were already victorious, they traveled on to the battlefield at Marathon, observed the scattered Persian dead, and praised the Athenians before returning home. Here in the narrative, Herodotus transitions to the aftermath of the battle. I will bring up some of those details in the next episode, which will carry us through to the end of the war and the end of Herodotus' book. He makes mention of some controversy about the Alcmenid family during this battle at Marathon. The Alcmenids were an Athenian clan, but I'll also relate the details of that family, which had great influence in classical Greece, in a future episode. Other historians have more to tell about the battle that the ghost of Theseus appeared, for instance, and led the soldiers into the fight. Then there is the Marathon legend, in which a runner brought news of the great victory from Marathon to Athens, about 26 miles, in just a few hours. This is a great story told by Plutarch, but it is probably a conflation of two episodes that I already mentioned. The runner, who sped to Sparta for aid, about 140 miles in a little over a day, and the quick march of the army back from Marathon, Marathon to defend Athens from possible sea invasion. And then there are two great men here, about whom I have said nothing so far, Aristides and Themistocles. They both participated in the battle and were likely generals. The Greek historian Plutarch tells of them, and I will also get into their interesting lives and deeds in future episodes. In the meantime, please check out the website at western-traditions.org. That's western-traditions.org. Catch up on older episodes, check out some of the books that I have recommended, buy some merch, and if you can, contribute to the podcast through PayPal or Patreon. And until next time, I thank you for listening to the Western Traditions Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>